Hello everybody, welcome to Digital Charcuterie. My name is Andrew Fantasia. Thanks for joining me as we begin the inaugural journey on a brand new mini series that we're gonna be doing here on the channel. A deep dive into every Marvel United box asterisk because I don't own every box, but almost every box. Off the top, please like, please subscribe, please bell. Uh, and if you're looking for a gift for a loved one, and that loved one happens to enjoy swords and wizards and magic and all that kind of stuff. I write about swords and wizards and magic and all that kind of stuff. These are my novels, We Were Wizards, part of a series that I've been working on for a long time. And you can get the first two books in this series right now on Amazon only. I will put a link in the description below. The first one is this purple one, and the next one is this gray one right here. Check it out if you're a fantasy fan. We were wizards. You're going to have a lot of fun with this because I sure had a lot of fun writing it. So welcome to the very first Digital Charcuterie United Deep Dive where I'm going to take a look into every single box that I own uh, and use this as a helping guide to all of you out there who don't own every box and who are considering which boxes to buy. That's who these videos are for. If you just are on the fence, you know, you want to start getting some United games, but you want to be careful where you spend your dollars. You don't think you'll like this box or you think you would love that box. I'm here to kind of help you take a look at exactly what's inside so you can make a more informed decision. At the end of every one of these deep dive videos, I am going to sort of mathematically break down everything that you can find in here uh, and give it a sort of points system ranking or rating so that you can decide what's best for you. Here's how the rating works. Every hero is going to be worth one point. Every villain is going to be worth two points because they just make the game more interesting. Every anti-hero, therefore, will be worth three points. We will also give one point for just every miniature in the box, plain and simple, because we like those. They're fun. Minis are exciting for gamers. Any special or oversized miniatures. So miniatures that are bigger than normal or miniatures that have special translucent plastic effects on them, those will be worth two points. Every location will be worth half a point, just because locations are pretty straightforward. Every new challenge mode will be worth one point as well. Any special game modes that change the face of the gameplay itself uh, will be worth two points. And those are rare, but we will come across them. And last but not least, if the box has equipment cards in them, that also gives the box an extra point. What better place to start than with the very first core box? So that's exactly what's going to happen. We're going to jump over to the table with my pretty bad lighting because it is pretty bleak and grim and gray here today. So all the lighting we can muster, I apologize in advance, but let's take a look at that core box together. Alrighty, here we go with our core box. This is season one, the core box, the very first most vanilla Marvel United you can possibly get. And though I said vanilla in a, uh, it sounded like a negative tone, it really isn't. Like this is still an exciting box, even though it's arguably the weakest core box, arguably the least interesting core box, right? It's just, it's good old-fashioned Marvel United in its purest form. So we're going to take a look at the back, because the backs of these boxes are actually something that I don't look at too often, because I'm too busy, you know, preoccupied with what's inside. And of course, we're going to get to that. But here's a look at what you can see on the back of the box. It gives you a nice visual representation of all the miniatures you're going to get. A little bit of a blurb, uh, which, you know what, we'll read this blurb here together. New threats emerge across the world as supervillains sow discord, seize power, and crush ordinary people beneath their heels. That's not very nice. What hope remains in a world where their master plans go unopposed? But where powerful villains rise, so too do mighty heroes. They'll travel the world in a desperate struggle to protect the innocent, face down dire threats, and confront these villains once and for all. It's a battle for the fate of the world, with victory only possible if the heroes stand 
United. Hey, they said it. They said the name of the game. And uh, I mean, even the back of these boxes are nice to look at, right? They're just visually striking. And you've got all your contents and errata over here. But we're going to take a look inside uh, at the juicy goodness. So let's crack this sucker open and take a look. Now inside here is our rule book. Uh, and I'll just flip through it quickly here so you get a sense of what you've got. Like beautifully laid out rule book, right? Vibrant, full color. Um, I don't know if any of you were the same way, but as a kid, I was one of those kids who, if I got a new Nintendo game or something for like a birthday or whatever, I would read the rule book front to back multiple times. Uh, and I know I'm weird. I know I'm in the minority, but I loved reading rule books because not only did it teach you, but reading rule books made me excited for the games themselves. I remember renting games from Blockbuster. Uh, and then, you know, back in the day when you rented a game, you got the rule book with it, which never happened uh, later on. But I would rent the game and I would, you know, read the rule book and then play it for a bit. And then it'd be time to go to bed. And before I go to bed, you know, the, the adults, the grownups would say, okay, time to turn off your Nintendo or whatever and go to bed. But they never said I couldn't read. And I would sit in bed and I would read the rule book for the game I just played to get myself excited so that the next morning I would be stoked to keep playing it. So I am a rule book fanatic and I know uh, that puts me in a strange nerdy minority, but I don't care. Anyway, nice solid rule book there, right? Covers everything that you need to know. Uh, then we have these plastic fittings, which are in every box. And I'm just gonna pop that over there. That's just a nice little protective casing. Now, throughout this series of deep dives, uh, as I go through every box, I've mentioned before on this channel that I store everything in kind of a erratic way. And most of my boxes will contain uh, cards or, or specific things in them that actually don't come in the boxes. And I will kind of sort those out video by video. But this is probably one of the only boxes in which that is not the case. Everything that you see in here is stuff that came in this box. So um, I'm going to start with the uh, the locations. The locations kind of go on top here. So those are the locations you are looking at. Stark Labs. Uh, and you can, you can kind of freeze frame these if you want to know what everything does. Central Park. All right, Times Square, one of my favorite locations in the game because its end of turn effect is very useful. Uh, whenever Times Square pops up, I'm a happy camper. The Shield Helicarrier, the Shield Headquarters, which I, I'm not going to lie, Shield really bores me. Their whole aesthetic is just very Stark and military. Uh, see what I did there? Stark. Um, it's, nah, Visually, doesn't do it for me. I think it's one of the most boring Marvel teams. Uh, sorry, New York Police Headquarters, another great end of turn effect. Not as good as Times Square, though. Avengers Mansion, which I don't think they ever use in any of the movies. And Avengers Tower, which they use very often in the movies. And that's it. Yeah, those are your eight locations. Every core box comes with eight locations, with the exception of DC Superheroes United. That one is going to come with ten uh, which is, they are playing with fire in the most wonderful ways in DC Superheroes United. They're really just going all out and giving us things we did not expect. We have our three villain dashboards for the three villains in this box. Red Skull, Ultron, and Taskmaster. Every time I teach somebody Marvel United for the first time, I always just bring my core boxes. I don't bring... Too many expansions because that's just too many boxes to bring. So what I would do is I would bring, you know, whatever core boxes I have and I would start them off with just Red Skull and this box. I would be like, okay, I would just put this box on the table. I would say, all right, we're going to fight Red Skull. And I would give them just this box to work with. And then after that game ends, whether we beat Red Skull or not, inevitably what always happens is they're excited. They're like, oh my God, that was a really fun game. And then I'm like, well... And then I drop all the other expansions or, or core boxes rather on the table. And I'm like, well, now your options have opened up even more. And their eyes just go wide with delight. Uh, it, it works like a charm every time. So every time I introduce new folks to Marvel United, 
I play by that same rubric and it works wonders. Another staple no core box should be without is our three mission cards. This is one of the things that makes me wish I got the cardboard uh, accessories because these get used a lot and you know, I don't want them to wear out. So having these in cardboard would be nice one day. And same with the locations and, and the dashboards too. Maybe one day, I don't know. I'm not going to cry about it uh, because I take care of my stuff anyway. I tend to keep everything as like new as possible. I have things that are 10, 20, maybe even older, years old, that are still presentable enough that I could theoretically take them back to a store and say, I just bought this and I want to return it. Uh, Cause that's just kind of how I was raised. I was raised to kind of take care of all my things. Um, these are our civilians and our thugs, which I've just put in a Ziploc baggie. These baggies come in very handy for the core boxes. Uh, and then there are the crisis tokens, which I've got in a smaller baggie. And then all of the tokens, uh, whether it's the health tokens here, right? Or the action tokens, which, all oh, right, I just happened to grab one of each. All of them are here, as well as some of the lesser used ones, I think are at the bottom too, but they are the lesser used ones, so... I don't use them that often. All right, on the left here are the hero decks. Uh, and that's been my go-to sorting method. I don't know why I do it this way. I just do all my heroes go on the left, all my villains go on the right of a box. As it was in the beginning, is now, and forever shall be. Couldn't explain why. I just like doing it that way. Uh, all right, so the heroes you get in this box are the Hulk, who, depending on who you ask in the Marvel United community, this might be one of the weakest decks in the entire game, which is saying something because there's a lot of hero decks. Uh, the Hulk just isn't a very balanced deck. He is mostly brawn, which makes sense, right? It's the Hulk. He moves a lot. Um, but when you end up with the Hulk, you really don't have a lot of heroic actions. Um, so you are kind of up the creek if you're facing a villain who requires a lot of heroic actions. That's why I'm sure the Grey Hulk was a fan favorite when they made the promo Grey Hulk. I can't wait to get my hands on him uh, once Witching Hour comes out. But yeah, every time I end up with the Hulk as one of my playable characters, I'm happy because he's my favorite Avenger, but I'm also like, ooh, I'm probably going to lose this fight because uh, it's the Hulk. Okay, next is Iron Man. Just classic vanilla Iron Man. Right. Very, very basic. Beautiful art. But very, very basic Iron Man. There he is. And the Wasp. Miss Evangeline Lilly. Canadian actor. Uh, speaking of Evangeline Lilly, it is the 20th anniversary of the TV show Lost. I don't know if anybody out there was a Lost fanatic. I was obsessed with Lost. Uh, it was still to this day one of my favorite shows of all time. I'm one of the people who absolutely love the way it ended. Uh, so I'm going back and re-watching it for its 20th anniversary. And it's the first time I've seen it in a long time, and it's very exciting. And whoa! And see, Evangelina's so excited. She's uh, flying, buzzing around too. All right. So that is the Wasp. Probably one of the stronger decks in this box. And also, she was a promotional character or something. I can't remember the details. People who followed the Kickstarter will know better than me, and they can chime in in the comments. But originally, this box was not supposed to include the Wasp or Ant-Man, I think. And then they just kind of retroactively decided, now we'll put them in there. Uh, and I think there was also a version of this box where Venom was a hero, too. I think that was like a Walmart exclusive or something. I don't know. There was a lot of weird stuff with the hero choices in this box. And I wasn't there for it because I only found out about this in season two. Um, Ant-Man is next. Again, more beautiful cards. That's particularly a really fun picture of Ant-Man. And this is the Scott Lang version of Ant-Man, the Paul Rudd version, if you will. Uh, as you can see, this whole box is very MCU uh, inspired because that's just the way they rocked and rolled with this when they made this initial game. It was at the height of phase three of the MCU. So the iron was hot and they struck. 
Captain America is next. Uh, yeah, I can definitely hold these a little closer. And yeah, it's good old fashioned vanilla Captain America. Looks very good. And again, a lot of people, from what I hear, were disappointed with um, the fact that you couldn't really throw the shield. Uh, it wasn't really an option in the deck anyway. Uh, so they they made that a thing for Season 3, both with the new cap and the uh, equipment cards, which are actually down there. The only thing that I have added to this box that wasn't in it initially. Uh, Black Widow is our next Avenger. She's my second favorite Avenger after the Hulk. And again, really useful deck, good cards. Her interrogate thing is great because it really just helps you uh, plan ahead when you're facing a villain. And because she's a spy, it's thematic, it's on brand, right? So that's Black Widow. And the final hero is Captain Marvel, who they made very powerful because she should be. She's Captain Marvel, right? Her deck is intensely more powerful than everybody else's. I think that's her weakest card, is just a single move. So if you're playing with kids, maybe, this is the best hero to give them, so that they have a little bit of a handicap starting off. Uh, and then you can give them something more challenging, like the Hulk, if you really want to be sadistic. And this is, of course, the Mohawk version of Captain Marvel. Uh, and yes, I have... Sorry, I, I promised I would remove everything that uh, didn't come with it, but... These did not come with this box, of course, because these are Season 3's equipments, but I have put them all in here anyway. Uh, if you want to take a look at those, we have Black Widow's Bite and her batons. We have Ant-Man's wrist gauntlets and his suit. We've got Captain America's shield, which made a lot of fans happy. we got a whole bunch of Iron Man things. He's basically one big giant walking equipment. And then we have the Wasp's Sting in her suit as well. But again, these do not come in this box. So if you purchase this box, you won't have these inside. It just happened to have a slot that was perfect for them. It's almost like Simon planned ahead. So I keep them in there. And on the villain side of things here, we have the Red Skull. So we can take a look at the Red Skull's villain deck. Here are his threats. He's got some henchmen. He's got some regular threats. So that's, this is part of what makes him just such a great beginner villain, because he's got a little bit of everything, including the tracker on his dashboard. So you really can give a new player a sense of what to expect villain-wise if you use Red Skull. He's perfect in that regard. All right, so there is a peek at what the Red Skull box is going to contain. Perfect starting villain. I have played him more than any other villain for good reason. And next is Ultron. All right. So Ultron also has some henchmen. And Ultron's whole deal is he is trying to fill up the board. He's trying to overflow everything because he wants to uh, create clones of himself. And basically, he wants Ultron to be everything and everywhere. If you saw the movie, you know what I'm talking about. It's hard to describe, but he is an AI at the end of the day. Uh, so he wants his AI to spread all throughout the world until... Every piece of technology is him. And your job is to stop that from happening. So it's very scary. We don't want that to happen. AI is bad enough without an evil James Spader robot pulling the strings behind the scenes. So yeah, Avengers assemble, please. And then finally, the third villain, the one who I have used the least, very rarely does, does he come up in my games, is the Taskmaster. All right, so Taskmaster has very uh, tricky threats. That's his whole thing, is his threats are... Uh, a pain in the neck to deal with. Uh, he has all these traps and explosions and just elite thugs. Very, very tricky threats. So I would, I think I would say he's the most difficult villain in this box. And then he also, you know, copies your abilities because that's Taskmaster's whole thing. And his deal is, uh, I believe he's putting crisis tokens on his dashboard. Yeah, he puts crisis tokens on his dashboard and you cannot damage him as long as there are any crisis tokens on his dashboard. So crisis tokens represent something different for every villain. In his case, they represent him being able to anticipate your moves and copy them because that's what he does. That's one of the things I love about the crisis tokens is how versatile they are as a game system. They can represent everything from the way a villain moves to poison to whatever. It's great. Um, 
Oh, I when I said I didn't put things in this box from other boxes, I lied because there is some stuff in here from other boxes. Uh, but at the bottom here, we have our threat tokens. There's six of them. And one of my favorite little pieces from Marvel United is this translucent blue tracker cube. And the reason I love this so much is because, you know, every box has a tracker cube and, or not, sorry, not every box, but every core box has a tracker cube and they're all different colors. Some other boxes have them too. And you use them for any villain who might have a tracker like so, right? And you would put them all throughout like this. But this is my favorite tracker cube in all of Marvel United. And the reason is because Red Skull's whole thing, the thing in the comics that he's always trying to do and in the movies is he's trying to get the cosmic cube. And the cosmic cube happens to look exactly like that. And this couldn't have been by accident. The people at CMON know what they're doing. So that's why it's my favorite tracker cube because it's not only a game piece, but it actually feels like a prop from the world of Marvel. And the only other time Marvel United has ever done that, given us like a legit three-dimensional prop of a, um, a an item is the Infinity Gauntlet, right? So that's why that makes me happy. Um, in here, in this little baggie, I have the invulnerable tokens and other little things. These green plan tokens are part of Kingpin. Uh, Kingpin uses these. He's the only one who uses them. But he comes in the stretch goal box and there's no room for anything in there other than those cards. So this is the perfect spot for them. I keep them here. But those do not come with this either. And finally, we're going to take a look at the miniatures and all the characters that you get in here. Uh, let's start from the left and work our way to the right. So this is Wasp. Uh, any of the characters who can shrink their miniatures are so exciting to me. Like, look, she's on a die for crying out loud. She's on a die. And then the creative ways they use to, to show that she's flying, you know, she's not actually sitting on the die, but we don't have the technology yet to make a miniature float. So until that day comes, we have to get creative. And that's exactly what they did. So this is great. I love this. Black Widow is next. And she's got her batons, her little widow batons there. Lots of good detail on her belt and her hair. Um, what I love so much about the way these United figures work is even unpainted, I, I don't paint any of my figures, even unpainted, their silhouettes are so identifiable. Hence the whole, who's that Pokemon game that Simon likes to play on Twitter. If I just showed you a silhouette of this, any United fan would know right away, oh, that's Black Widow. And even maybe somebody who hasn't seen United, but who's just a Marvel fan would kind of know based on, you know, the the shape and, and the weapons she's holding. So it's a very, very smart process that the sculptors use when it comes time to figuring out what these are going to look like. They hit the nail on the head. Walt Disney once said that uh, the best cartoon characters are the ones that are immediately identifiable in silhouette, uh, which is why if you look at a show like The Simpsons, The Simpsons, the main five family members, all have very striking silhouettes, uh, which is why they're such memorable characters. The design team of United must have been listening to Walt Disney because every single piece, even this Iron Man one, a character who arguably could look very generic if done improperly, he looks great. I'm going to move my light so that it's a little more where it ought to be. There we go. Sorry, it's it's uh, raining cats and dogs here in Canada right now, uh, and it's I'm in a basement, so it's incredibly gloomy, so I really need to light this uh, specifically. But there's Iron Man, and I love the little shock wave coming out of him, and again, he's rocketing off the ground, Sweet, very dynamic poses. Captain America in his center stage spot there. Uh, his shield is a little wibbly wobbly. It's a little bit bent, but you know, that doesn't bother me very much. And I know people know tricks to like submerge it in hot water and it it can become a little bit more flexible if that's your thing. But I don't, I don't like to mess with these because I'm bad when it comes to being handy. I'm not very handy and artsy and craftsy like I will break things before I will make them better. So I uh, I tend not to mess with that. And I'm just like, you know what? This shield is fine. It doesn't bother me. And it's the Hulk now. 
Hulk Smash. A fantastic, fantastic rendition of the Hulk. It's very hard to make the Hulk look cute. Chibi characters are kind of cute by nature, but they managed it. They found a way. The thing about the Hulk is he's so dynamic and monstrous that you don't even need to put him in an overly crazy pose. Like, he's he's not picking up a car or anything, right? He's just kind of standing there. But he looks incredible, as is. Captain Marvel is next. A very complex uh, swirl of air on her base here to show that she's flying. Um, and I think that they did a great job with that Marvel symbol on her chest, too. Even though it's season one, box one, they were already on top of their game when it came to the miniatures. You would hope, because they're called Cool Mini or not, for crying out loud. And then the final hero is Ant-Man. And that coin has a whole lot of detail. It's a quarter. And it's villain time. Villains are always more fun. Uh, the Red Skull here, appropriately red. And he's just kind of standing around, standing on his base, uh, sometimes just for fun. I like to do this. I like to take the Cosmic Cube and put it in his hand, and he's like, oh, look what I found! And I'm like, yeah, I know, you found the Cosmic Cube, but I'm going to take it away because you're evil and you don't deserve it. Again, not the most dynamic pose because it doesn't need to be, because his silhouette already does that work for you. Taskmaster is next. Very scary skull face. He's got a sword, and he's got a shield, and Taskmaster Shield has a very distinct logo, and they didn't shy away from that either. Um, sorry, it's hard to see with this lighting, but yeah, there you go. Sorry, guys, this is literally, I, I'm in a basement. This is as bright as I can get this shot on a gloomy day like today. Um, yeah, but yeah, he looks magnificent. I love a good cape and hood, right? As a Hobgoblin fan, a cape and hood goes a long way with me. There is Taskmaster, who I definitely need to use more often because he's the least used character in this box for me so far. But his name only comes up when it comes up. And there's Ultron. The thing about Ultron, especially the MCU version, is he's very overly designed, right? There's a lot of design in him. He's very complex. Thankfully, Simon just kind of narrowed it down and simplified it. Uh, and I think this miniature looks great. The fins really help. Creates that distinct silhouette. Those are the first miniatures ever in Marvel United. Uh, and from this point on, when I take a look, a deep dive into a box, I will be showing you the miniatures in the order that I like them the most, in ascending order, right? In here, um, the miniatures are simple but elegant, but I would say my favorite one has probably got to be Ant-Man. Uh, just the amount of detail on that coin and the creativity of that, uh, just to showcase his height or lack thereof. What a perfect piece of sculpting. Uh, Tiago and company should be real proud of that work. But that's what we've got in the core box. Storage-wise, if you are a sleever like I am, um, you might run into some problem with the core boxes. I've run into it with every core box so far. Uh, one thing I should make note of, if you have not noticed, I do not sleeve the threat cards just to save money on sleeves and just because I don't really need to. I feel I feel like the need to sleeve them is not terribly great. I always end up in this box with a bit of a rise with all the heroes. So I always end up having one of them. In this case, it's, you know, whoever I used last. So Captain Marvel at this point. Uh, I would put her in the center well on top of all these tokens. And that helps even it out. Otherwise, it would pop up on one side. Storage-wise, it is the easiest core box that I have to deal with because it's the simplest. So if this feels like a box that you might want to invest in, I would highly recommend it. I mean, it has some of the most classic characters in Marvel, especially if you're an MCU fan, because it's really geared towards that, towards the Avengers in particular, right? And because of the simple nature of this box and because it was a mass-produced retail box, you can find this very easily. Amazon might have it, sure, but you can also find it at like Targets and Walmarts and even better, a local game store. So you know you're not giving 
money to billionaires like the Walton family and Bezos, you can actually give money to your local game store instead. But this is super easy to find and it's inexpensive compared to the expansions. So if you're a United fan, let's say you have the X-Men one, or let's say you just discovered the DC one and you're getting that, and you're thinking of expanding your United repertoire, you can't go wrong with this. The, the price is very right, and it's just got, like, look, look what you're getting. You are getting a plethora of classic big-name heroes and some pretty big-name villains, too. Taskmaster, in particular, is going to be pretty hot next year because uh, the MCU version is showing up in Thunderbolts. So this might become a hot commodity, uh, but I would recommend highly that you get this if you're looking to start or continue a United collection, because it's just, it's a core box for one thing. So you're getting a whole lot of goodies in here and you can't go wrong with the character choice. The Marvel United core box contains seven heroes, three villains, and eight locations. It also gets an extra point just for being a core box because you kind of need one of those to play the game. It also comes with a solo mode that we didn't quite touch on called the Shield Solo Mode. And there's a reason I didn't touch on it. And I'll get to that when we talk about a different box. But it's just a mode that helps you play solo if you want an optional solo thing. Uh, so we'll give that two points for a grand total of 29 points of worthiness. Pretty good amount. Uh, and as you'll see, the more into these deep dives we will get, the more we will contrast and compare all the different point values that we're going to assign to each of these boxes. And you're going to get a real nice look at exactly how much bang you are getting for your buck every time. So that'll do it for the very first of these deep dives. I promise not every episode is going to be as long as this one. Uh, we just needed to spell out the rules and all that fun stuff here. So thank you so much for joining me here on Digital Charcuterie as we continue to make the wait for DC Superheroes United a little bit shorter and a whole lot sweeter. See you next time.